our previous speaker this morning. Uh, and then about their, their talks about mental health and environmental literacy. Okay, say good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll be talking about the, the topic that we discussed this afternoon is about the nursing informatics. And nursing informatics has been a trend nowadays because technology is easily accessible. Well, well, in fact, with the use of modern technology, delivery of quality nursing care has become more efficient. Don't you agree, partner? Yes, I agree. <laughs> and uh, without further ado, to give us more information on the trends about the uh, about this informatics, let's call on Miss Mary Ellen Burgo to introduce to us our next speaker. Our speaker for this afternoon is Mom Lisa Alcaraz. She manages the healthcare team of Teledevelopment Services Incorporated. The healthcare division offers various healthcare information management solutions, including medical coding training and certification, medical billing training, basic healthcare training, trainer support, and other project-specific healthcare training and consulting programs. She has been a medical coding trainer for five years, having worked with global solutions, virtual resources, a medical indexing and medical coding company, and healthcare coding and billing institute, a medical coding training company. She has been a certified professional coder since 2012 and is one of a handful certified professional coder instructors in the Philippines. She is a graduate of the University of the Philippines and earned her combined bachelor's basic medical sciences and doctor of medicine degrees under the seven-year department program. Um, let us give her a warm So, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon to every one of you. Thank you for waiting. I know that this has been postponed for quite a few times. It's, it's Friday and it's payday, so you can, you can expect the traffic was going to be a problem. Um, so, before we start, um, I'd like to know, are all of you nursing graduates? Nursing students, and you're going to graduate this year yes. at the end of the camp. Yes. So you're going to take the boards in June or July. Yes. Good luck. Okay, so um, before we start, let me introduce myself further. Um, all those names, uh, all those initials after my name, are all related to healthcare. You're familiar with MD, and I'm sure you're aiming to get your RN too. But the CPC. I and CIC are all related to the nursing informatics field of medical coding. So thank you for inviting us to, to give you a short talk, to give you an overview of the medical coding industry. So okay, so let's start with a few icebreakers. I have here some facts for you. So, first person to answer this question, the prefix hyper is common in the medical language and what is the meaning of the term hypertension? Please raise your hand. Anyone? Yes? Yes. Increased blood pressure. So, hyper means? High. Okay, and tension is your? Blood pressure. Me. Thank you. Okay, next question. Let's give her a round of applause for being brave. Okay, next. What are the four valves of the heart? Okay, the lady at the back. We have the 
we give all of these assistance to BPOs. Okay, so we've been in the country for 25 years. So kasabi namin lumalaki yung mga BPOs here in the Philippines. Okay, we have served over 500. Some of them aren't even in the Philippines anymore, but they were definitely here when the BPO started cropping up. When you say BPO, that's business process. So um, I think the more familiar term would be the call centers. They're now called contact centers because uh, when the BPO industry expanded, we now have other centers who don't do any contact. No voice calls. So they chat or email, and some office processes are also within the scope of the BPO industry. Okay. So we have we provide services for um, the BPOs in all of these fields. Okay. So my division is in charge of healthcare, healthcare training, and one of the uh, uh, courses that we give is on medical coding. Okay. So we have been in, in place in TBS since 2013. We, we are a partner of AAPC. Later we'll know what AAPC is and how important it is to the HIM industry. Okay, and we are working on initiatives with HIMAP, which is the Association of um, Healthcare BPOs in the Philippines. And TESTA, I'm sure you know what TESTA is. Because we want to develop medical coding, not just in the BPOs, but in the Philippines. So that's why TESTA is becoming involved okay so here is a short blurb of our training catalog so we have training for medical coding and billing healthcare basics which you already know like med terms and anatomy we also give a course on um, healthcare in the u.s okay and we have courses for clinical nursing so this is ut utilization management and review okay so let's go to the lecture proper so when we talk about healthcare, we are actually talking about two distinct sides, okay? So as doctors and as nurses, we are directly involved in patient care. Okay, so checkups, procedures, monitoring, prescribing, dispensing. Okay, when we do our patient care, one of the things that is very important for us to complete are the, the information that we generated from giving all these services. For example, whenever a doctor does a checkup, he has to complete that, he has to file that with um, with uh, medical record services and in turn medical records has to compile that with all the other records of the same patient. Okay, when you do your monitoring or when you do your IV insertions, you need to check the medication list, the patient has a monitoring sheet. So, so that's data generated by the service that you give. When the doctor prescribes and the pharmacist fills the prescription, there is another record okay, saying that this patient was given this medication. Okay. So anyone who does home therapy, okay, they will have their own charts. People who have home care, like uh, your private duty nurses, they will have their own records in the homes of the patient. Because all of these things are generating data. And those data are very specific to the patient. Okay. On the other side, because we have all that data, okay, there is a need now to, you see now because medical records, they need to compile that, right? Okay, so that is part of patient information management. So all the charts have to be compiled, they have to be uh, arranged chronologically, they have to be stored correctly, they have to be stored properly so that when a patient asks for his medical records, he can get records for as long as he was a patient in that hospital, right? Doctors have to file operative reports, okay? Lab and path reports, okay? And then if they're a member of PhilHealth or if they have HMO, then they need to contact someone. Let's say if the procedure is covered, they have to ask, right? And then the hospitals will also have to file their own paper so that they will be reimbursed. Okay, so those are two sides of, of the healthcare coin. Okay, this is what we are 
used to. Okay? Patient delivery. Okay? So around that is um, a lot of data that we are generating because of that, because of the uh, healthcare delivery. Okay, so anyone, anyone who faces a patient will generate data. Anyone who who is involved in the care, even without facing the patient. For example, there are some consultants, like patho consultants, that will not see the patient. Maybe they'll see um, a specimen or a body part, but still they render service to that patient. Okay, so they generate the data. Okay, the this is the cycle of life and death. So the patient care side is very. Um, very much focus on the life and the death processes of a patient. On the other side, on the patient information management side, okay, they are focused on the patient, but primarily on the patient's data. So if the patient has insurance, if that was denied, how many HMOs the patient is under, if is the patient in an HMO, or just feel health, or both, okay. so. What kind of records does he have? Does he have records in, as an inpatient? Does he have records from a clinic as an outpatient? Okay, so that's the kind of data on this side. Okay, and this, um, as opposed to talking about the death and life processes of the patient, this one is concerned with. Okay, this one is concerned with money. Okay, so. I use dollars. <laughs> okay, so any any data generated will be concerned with payment. Payment for the doctor, payment for the HMO, for the hospital. How much is the patient allowed to pay? How much is the patient required to pay? What kind of discount did he get? So all of this is about money. Okay, so when we talk about healthcare information, okay. In this world, of, in, the, in the digital world, there are a lot of things that, is gen that are generated, a lot of data generated. So we are moving away from direct patient care because there are such places as the internet, okay, where people can search for their symptoms and um, self-medicate or self-diagnose. Okay, let's take a quick look. We have how many potential patients do we have? The population is right now 7.4 billion. Okay, in 2015, there were 5.4 million births, 2.3 million deaths. Okay, the Philippines population is 102 million. In the U.S., it's 323 million. Okay, when you talk about the data that all of these healthcare processes have generated. If you look at the U.S., I use U.S. data because they are more up-to-date. So this is 2015 data. Okay. So there have been 35.1 discharges, 51.4 million procedures performed, 125.7 million, we're talking in the millions, outpatient visits, 136.3 million emergency department visits. Okay. So these are in the millions. When you talk about the internet population, 2.4 billion people are in, on the web, okay? And there's 4 million Google searches per minute, okay? I didn't find any data on how much of the 4 million is about healthcare, but I would guess that it's, uh, it's quite a big chunk, okay? So, uh, so aside from the, uh, the flow of data in the web, this is what we are used to, the flow of data in the health departments, okay, like in the hospitals or in the clinics. So this is the this side is for people generating data. So you will get the patient who has medical records and health records. So medical records that means everything that has been done to the patient in the hospital, in the clinics. In any any medical provider. When you say health records, that includes those that are in the health and wellness side. Okay, so uh, non-physician services. Okay, so you get data from there. This basic data from the patient will be expanded when he meets 
the providers, so the doctors and the hospitals and other health and wellness providers. Okay, so they will generate their own data on top of the patient's personal data. Uh, after they, the patient receives the service, okay, it will generate another data which is about the payment because any service needs to be paid. So there are two ways. So either the government pays for part of it, like, like PhilHealth, and there are also other private companies that are in charge of the payment. So we started with very basic data, imagine now. Okay, this is just history, PE. Okay, you will add the doctor's diagnosis, okay, the progress reports, the discharge diagnosis, okay, um, discharge medications, and then you will add the, the billing, how much did the patient spend in the hospital. So that is the flow of data when you look at it from patient care. Okay, so when you look at it from the health information management, we now we see the uh, workflow, the processes that are in charge of processing that data. So you know about medical transcription, these people encode what is um, either written in the chart or they hear it verbally from a dictation, okay? So a transcription will either read charts, handwritten charts, a medical transcriptor will, be, will read charts and type them. So they will transform it from handwritten to digital, okay? They will all get, get also the, uh, transcribe operative reports, SOAD notes by the doctor. Okay, so that's, this is the first level of data that generated by the patient, okay? Next, after the patient has been seen by a provider, okay, by the doctor or by, by the hospital, it will be transformed into codes. We will talk about this later. So there are two types of codes. If the patient is in the hospital, okay, there is a certain type of code used. If the patient is in a doctor's clinic or maybe in a PT or OT clinic or in other wellness um, services, that will generate a certain type of code. Okay, falling under outpatient. Okay, and then the third one, billing. Now we will talk about claims to be submitted to the government or to the HMOs and the reimbursements that they will get. So how much money will they be paid? Okay, so we, we, if you see, we have transformed, we have transformed the data generated by, by these people data that has been processed by the, the other side of uh, healthcare. Okay. So when we talk about H HIM, this is what we are talking about. Okay. This workflow. So the definition of HIM is acquiring, analyzing, and protecting digital, so digital, and traditional. When I say traditional, handwritten notes, okay, handwritten prescriptions, which are vital to providing quality patient care. So we have charts, whether they are handwritten or entered in a, tab in a tablet. Okay. So this is the world of health information management. How to acquire that, how to analyze the data, and how to protect the same data. Okay, there are a lot of HIM rules because of those three processes. Okay, you don't have to copy these. Okay, so an uh, um, example of people required for um, acquiring data, okay? So you have your document management people. These are the people in charge of, it's like your medical records, okay? Management of physical and digital data. Okay, and then you have people in charge of the EMR, which is the electronic records, okay? And then for people analyzing, there are a lot of people analyzing the data. You have your um, meta. So transcription will come under acquiring data. Medical coding, billing, discharge management, analytics, abstraction, utilization review. They're all about acquiring data. Okay? So protecting data will be the uh, job of a very, very small population. They're not even here. These are the uh, health information technicians. 
Okay, so let's go to um, some de other definitions. When you say an electronic medical record, this is a digital version of the patient charts. Okay. Aside from patient charts, notes of the nurses are also part of the electronic medical records. Prescriptions by the PT or OT for therapy are also part of electronic medical records. Electronic health records is a bigger uh, chunk. Okay. This focuses on the total health of the patient. So if the patient goes, let's say, to an acupuncturist, okay, this is, that's part of his electronic health records. If the patient goes to a spa or a wellness clinic, that's part of his electronic health records. The personal health record is the part of the record that is held by the patient. So all of these okay, are records regarding a specific patient. It just depends on how much knowledge there is in that record. Okay, when you talk about HIM, you also talk about revenue cycle management. So this is the part where, um, where money comes in. This is about payment. This is about submitting claims with uh, generation of revenues by the hospital. Okay. So on this side, this side must be able to communicate with the EHR EMR side because aside from giving the aside from ensuring that the patient has been given the proper care, this must also ensure that the persons who provided the care to the patient are properly uh, reimbursed or properly given their payment. Okay, so that is a bit be beyond our scope. Okay, so we will focus on medical coding. So what actually is medical coding? It's a specialized profession in healthcare administration. So in HIM, a med medical coding is just one of the dots in the whole picture. Okay, what do they do? They review the documentation and then they translate them into codes. So these codes are either all numbers, numeric, or letter and number, so alphanumeric. It is different from encoding. Encoding is just listening to something or reading something and then typing it onto a form. In medical coding, you need to analyze the data, which is mostly in the form of charts or medical records. You have to analyze them and then you have to translate them into codes. We will talk about those codes later. So, um, to, to, for, to more properly um, track the history of medical coding, I decided to use um, the U.S. history data because this is um, the development of medical, code, medical coding is very much parallel to the development of medical coding in the U.S. Okay, so it, is, it started with the development of what you call the international classification of diseases. Okay. okay. And then it ended, or it started its bloom in 1996 when this act was passed in the U.S., the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Okay. This was enacted in 1996 and established rules on healthcare. Okay. So in the U.S., healthcare is a very, very big industry. They have a lot of laws about it. They have a lot of laws about generating the data. They have a lot of laws about protecting the data. They have a lot of laws about how much should hospitals and doctors actually be paid as opposed to how much should a patient pay. Okay. So this, that's, this is bigger than what is being done in the Philippines. Okay, they also mandated, this law mandated that tra transactions be filed electronically. So meaning, all the charts have to be digitized, all the lab reports, okay, all the reimbursement claims have to be digitized. So they are doing away with paper. Okay, so let's do a quick rundown. Medical coding has been around since 1850, okay. In the 1850s, what they had there was a list of causes of death. Just that. So they would track how many people died from maybe cholera, how many people died from an infection. Okay. In 1860, you know her very well, Florence Nightingale. She was actually one of the major proponents to develop a 
collection system. Okay? So aside from just listing the causes of death, Florence Nightingale wanted that the data in the hospital be actually organized. Okay? There should be a systemic model to follow when you are collecting and storing data. Okay, so this was followed in 1893, okay, by Jacques Bertillon. Okay, he actually made a classification of the causes of death. So aside from just listing the causes of death, you have developed a classification. Okay, it was adopted in 1898 and in 1900, see, as far back as the 1900s. Okay, let's skip to 1948 because this is when an international system of collecting data was created. It was called the International Classification of Diseases, okay? adopted by the World Health Organization. By this time, it was already on its sixth revision, okay? and then they changed the name. In 1966, there was another data set which was created. It was called the Current Procedural Terminology created by the AMA, American Medical Association. So aside from international classification of diseases, which was a classification, a list of diseases causing death and causing illness, they also had a list of procedures, okay? So these two were adopted in 1967. In 1977, US followed suit and created their own their own code set based on the international classification of diseases. Okay, another set was developed in 1978. So this this one healthcare common procedure coding system was a list of supplies, okay, items and services provided. So wheelchairs they already developed a system of coding for wheelchairs, sponges, syringes, drugs vials, okay, all of these are in this code set, okay. So in 1983, uh, the DOH version of the U.S. decided that uh, ICD and CPT should be used when filing for Medicare Part B benefits. Medicare Part B is like our field health. So, in the U.S., if you will charge the government for a procedure that was done to you, it should be submitted using the ICD and the CPD codes. Okay, so in 1987, they also adopted the procedure. So now everything that has to be submitted to the government has to be under either the ICD code set, the RIGPIX code set, or the CPD code set. Okay, so after that, um, the private payers follow suit. Okay. So in 1996, this is the end point of my my history slide earlier. Okay, so 1996, it was passed in Congress that the three must be used when submitting codes to the government and in any in any office that wants to transact with government healthcare. So that is basically all of healthcare in the US. Okay. So what does this mean is that everyone dealing with that data had to learn ICD, CPT, and HIPPICS if they wanted their companies to be paid. Okay. Okay, so just a few more. Um, all this slide says is that since 1996, the US and practically most of the world has used ICD-9. We know that in the Philippines, we already use ICD-10 because ICD-10 has been around since 2009. Okay, so the, Philippi uh, the Philippines has been using ICD-10. If you look at PhilHealth for reimbursements for submissions, they use ICD-10 codes. And are you trained in ICD-10? So when you graduate from nursing and if you want to work in the, in the local hospitals, you're, you're going to think about to undergoing ICD-10 training. It's being given right now by DOH and by UP Manila. Okay, so in the U.S., they're still stuck in 
ICD-9 until October of last year when they, did, when they decided that we have to go into ICD-10. Okay. So that is the development of medical coding. A big part of it happened in the U.S. So right now there is medical coding aside from the U.S. in South Korea, in Thailand, in Australia, in Canada. Um, and the Middle East countries are also starting to adapt medical coding. Okay, so that, that is how big the industry is. Okay, so what type of data are coded? So number one, of course, diagnosis. That is the most important part of the patient's chart, right? Because everything that the doctor and the nurses and every healthcare provider does is dependent on the diagnosis. Procedures are also coded. Physician services. So where is the physician? Is it a clinic? Is it a hospital? Is it a rehab facility? Okay. It's also coded. Services like the PT, OT, chiropractor. Okay, those are coded. Supplies, um, orthosis and prosthesis, drugs. Okay. So once again, medical coding is not encoding. So what are the advantages brought about by transferring all that data using medical coding? Number one, when they transferred it to alphanumeric codes, okay, these are easily understood by computer systems. Later on, I'll show you an example. Okay, so all these codes are portable. So they are maybe a string of eight, five to eight characters. So it's very easy to store them. You don't need um, a whole room of medical records just to store someone's data. Standardized, and so translated internationally, uh, the ICD-9, CM, ICD-10, CM, CBT, and HIPAA are all acceptable in countries outside the U.S. And uh, actually, we have worked with a, with a local HMO who wanted to translate all their codes into CPT also. Okay. And then so it's easy to transmit because those are just a string of numbers, not paragraphs and pages and pages of documents. Okay, here's an example. So you have a patient in the ER. She's maybe three or four. She has a history of asthma. Okay, you determine that she is in exacerbation. Okay. You give her, you have her use a nebulizer or maybe an inhaler. And since this is a child, you decide to get a spacer. Okay. So this is it. So if you write that in the chart, you're diagnosed, you will need an ED, an emergency department form, right? It's different from inpatient forms. Okay. You also need a diagnosis. So the diagnosis is mild intermittent asthma in acute exacerbation, which you have determined from the history and the PE. Okay. okay. So under P, your treatment was inhalation. Okay. And you, you will charge her because you got a spacer from your supplies. Okay. So if you write that in the chart, okay, that is easily one or two pages if you add the history and the PE. If you translate these into codes, this is what you'll get. An emergency department visit will be a 99284. That's five, five uh, units, five items. Okay. Your mild intermittent asthma in acute exacerbation will be recorded as another five units, J45.21. Okay, inhalation treatment will be a 94640. And your inhaler with spacer, it's an A46727, but your rules will tell you that it is not covered. So the patient will have to pay for that. So those are the, the things that um, medical coding makes easy. As, so if you have your five pages chart, you will now submit a claim maybe a one-page claim with only with only this in your facility code, this as your diagnosis, this as your procedure, and it also tells your it also tells your um, HMO or whoever you're submitting it to that you have charged the patient for a spacer. 
okay so that is how how it uh, how the how medical coding helps make the data more what did we say portable easy to store okay you can send this to the US or to the to Australia or to any non-English speaking company and if they have the code set for this then they can easily translate this into their own language okay. so that is how uh, medical coding makes documentation easier okay. um, do you, shall we pause for questions you have questions does anyone have questions so far None? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so these are the tools that you need for medical coding. All those numbers are can, can be found within these three sets. Okay, so the first set is called your ICD. This is the ICD. This is what it looks like. So now it's ICD-10. You have your CM, which means this is the ICD used by the US. And you have your PCS, which means that this set contains codes for procedures. Okay. You have your CPD, which is your code set for procedures, and your hit picks, with containing the codes for the spacer or the supplies. Okay. People working in the, in the industry already have software versions, so they don't need to lug around all these books when they go to work or when they go home or when they work from home. Okay, so here's the example for ICD 10 CF. So your mild intermittent asthma in exacerbation is your J45.2. Okay, so you have your 2.0 uncomplicated, you have your 0.21 for in acute exacerbation, you have your 0.22 if the patient is in status asthmatic. So it already provides descriptions for all the coding scenarios and they are. Um, divided by system, by system and then by disease. It also gives you certain rules, okay, when you are coding for asthma. So for example, if your the asthma is due to tobacco dependence, then you need to add this. Okay, there are certain rules for coding, which the manual will tell you. Okay, so aside from diseases, it also has codes for History. Let's say the patient has a history of, of lung cancer. Okay, let's, let's say it's an adult. Or maybe the patient has a family history of certain types of cancers. Okay, you can also add codes for that in addition to the diagnosis codes. Okay, this manual is used to code for procedures in the hospital. The CPD manual is your standard for coding procedures. Okay, so developed by the American Medical Association. Um, we said earlier that the patient is in the emergency department. Okay, so for you to use this code, you should have had a detailed history, a detailed exam, and there are certain rules for, me, uh, for medical decision making. So as an example, if the doctor ordered a spirometry, as opposed to just the doctor giving a prescription. So the, the doctor who ordered a spirometry can use a code higher than this. That means he will get paid more because he did more to manage the patient. If the doctor just gave um, a prescription, said, oh, it's asthma, so I'll just give a prescription, then maybe this doesn't fit the 284 and then you will have to use a, a lower code. So he will also get paid less. Okay. The third set up. So there are also codes here for procedures. So the patient underwent a nebulization. So under under this manual, there is this code when you use a, a nebulizer, an MDI, or an IPPB device. Okay, and it also tells you the rules for when you can use this and how you can use this. The last one, the last section is about supplies. So it says there that the inhaler itself is not covered. So you won't, you won't code that. What you will code is the use of the spacer. 
Okay, so this is the code for a spacer. Okay, so you will, this is part, this is the work of the medical coder. After this, when all of this has been submitted, someone called the medical biller will review all the codes that you have done and enter that into a claims form, which is what they will submit for payment. So it's basically also another another professional who has maybe less mastery of this, just enough to be familiar with this. But choosing all of these codes and learning how to use it is the job of the medical coder. Okay, there are different types of coders. There are coders who who only go for physician office. So doctors clinics only. There are coders who code only for outpatient hospitals. Okay. Uh, there are coders who do home health. There are coders who specialize in maybe interventional radiology or um, pathology, okay. ENT. There are coders who are very highly specialized. OB. Okay. Then there are medical coding auditors. So these are coders who have had years and years of experience. So now what they do is they audit or they check the codes. And then there are also practice management specialists. These are coders who have um, expanded their services into managing the, the practice. So what they do, they teach the doctors how to document properly. They teach the, the nurses how to enter these codes into the into the charts so that they are stored properly. So those are practice management specialists. Okay, in the Philippines, um, we have had um, we have had an influx of healthcare companies from the U.S. and others coming into the Philippines. Okay, why? A big part of that is I told you earlier about the HIPAA rule in 1996 that says that everything must be what stored and sent electronically the americans don't want to do it okay they don't want jobs like that okay so the medical coding population in the u.s is very small we were talking about their how much is their population 323 all of them generating healthcare data and only a very small population of people willing to do this type of work so that's why they started to look and they remember, HIPAA says they must do it or else they won't get paid. So that's a lot of money needing to be processed. So what they did was they started looking around. First they started looking in India. Okay, and then a few years back, maybe in 2010, they started looking to the Philippines. Okay, it grew, it grew rapidly from there. This is a 2015 data. So when you talk about FTEs, that those are full-term employees, full-time employees. So in 2015, we we needed to target around 100,000 coders and um, workers in billing and in other types of HIM. So in 2014, we already reached 86,000. So we needed to hire how many more people? Only 14,000 more to reach 100,000. And it started only as 14,000. So that's how big the expansion was. When you talk about revenue, this is in millions of dollars. So this is 102 million. This is 1.3 billion. And in 2015, we were on track to generate $2 billion revenue from the healthcare industry alone. Okay. So we had a 